Certified Christian Yoti. According to many theorists, the visible universe has an invisible counterpart, giving us the ability to draw on good and evil spirits lying dormant in our realm and the next. Using black magic, it is possible to contact these entities in order to aid magicians in a particular act. Christian did just that. In one act, it is clearly visible that something greater was at play than just himself. In the act, he can be seen levitating a small ball, while holding three others in each hand that are constantly in motion. However, don't look at his hands, but instead his eyes. His eyes are dark, almost black, but during one moment he blinks, revealing clear eyes. Eyes that are perhaps no longer his own, but someone else's that could be residing inside himself. Perhaps confirming that his physical body is out of control and that the power inside is using an invisible power to levitate the balls. In at four, Yif. Yif is a magician who specifically relies on elements from religion to aid in his tricks, and in the process pushing the message of Jesus and steering towards the dark. One trick in particular begins with him showing his friends a picture of Moses, stating, Who is he? Who on earth is he? Moses, the greatest myth in history. People tell their children that there was a man who parted the sea. It became a legend. We magicians should be challenging legends, and Yif did just that. The very next day he took a cup of coffee, parting it completely down the middle using what? Well, seemingly nothing other than the power from his hands and a little bit of breath. What magic was at play? Well, with the religious ties to the trick, many believe that he conjured a demonic entity to assist him. Or perhaps the legend of Moses himself took part in the act. What do you guys think though? In at three, Mirandejo. Arnold Kentskis, known more famously by the pseudonym Mirandejo, was a Dutch magician in the 20s and 30s who was commonly known for radically piercing his body with various objects, resulting in seemingly no injury, astounding medical professionals in the process. Now many are unsure whether he had psychological health issues causing his delusions and lack of fear, but many think he had ties to a demon, a demon that spoke to him, telling him to pierce his body with needles. In the end, this was his ultimate demise. It was reported that Mirren was instructed by voices to eat a steel needle, which he did. It was surgically removed two days later. That same day he walked out of the hospital, appearing completely fine. However, not long after he entered a trance like state, laying down on his bed, never waking up. Were the voices the result of underlying health issues or was it something more? Coming in at two, Dynamo. It's always come into question whether Dynamo was a member of a secret society, seeking to break the laws of the universe by calling upon a higher power or dark magic to aid him in his trick. Dynamo has become one of the world's most recognized and renowned magicians, whose tricks are unfathomable and can only be explained by something grander than the universe. I'm going to be discussing two occasions. The first being the necklace. During one trick, Dynamo asks a guy to pull his necklace through his neck. She does. He examines the necklace. There is nothing unusual, no weak element, no missing link. Yet he was able to pull it right through Dynamo's own neck. There was no blood, nothing, not even a scar. So how did he do it? Well, to many, a great power was at play, aiding the magician in his trick. Not only that, but on another occasion, Dynamo walked across the Thames in London, with seemingly no wires or strings to keep him afloat. The symbolism of Jesus walking on water was not lost on viewers, and again, many were quick to name the devil as his aid during the trick. And lastly in at number one, David Blaine. Seems David Blaine takes a lot of cues from another number on our list, Mirandejo. Blaine has mastered the ability to pierce his own body with needles and objects, remaining unharmed in the process and leaving no marks or scars following it. On one occasion, he sat down with Ricky Gervais, forcing him to watch on as he pierced his bicep with a long needle, and then made Gervais remove it. He does just that, in horror of course, stating that this is not a trick, this is real, what have you done? Exactly what we all thought, until the needle was removed and there was no blood, or seemingly any marks, and to quote Blaine, that's the one thing that doesn't make any sense. Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Freemason, confessed that all magicians were aided by demonic entities. Is Blaine one of those magicians? Starting off this countdown, we have Julia Brown. Julia Brown was a well-known voodoo practitioner and witch in her small town in Louisiana. People knew her for her charms and her curses, as well as the creepy songs that she would sing on her porch with her guitar. In her community, people would come to her and she would perform a number of different rituals for them. That was until people started to take advantage of her, so she started to get back at them. When they came to her, she would scare them by telling them predictions like they're gonna die soon or bad things were coming for them. Then the locals were like, okay, what's going on with her? Close to her death, Julia started to act strange. She would constantly sing songs about her death and how she would get revenge on the town. One song that she would sing goes as so, when I die, I take the whole town with me. When I die, I take the whole town. 
Not a very cheery and upbeat song if you ask me. In fact, no one knew what she was talking about until the day that she passed away. On September 29, 1952, Julia passed away. On that day, the town came together for her funeral. Well, as they were lowering her casket into the ground, rain came down hard. This rain later turned into a disastrous hurricane that wiped out the entire town. So it's believed that before she left, she put a curse on the town, which is what she meant by, when I die, I'm taking the whole town with me. Over the years, a number of people have attempted to rebuild the town, but every time they do, it ends up getting destroyed again. Maybe her curse is real then. In our fourth spot today, we have Gerald Gardner. Gerald Gardner is often called the father of modern witchcraft, and that's due to the fact that he founded Wicca. Although technically he learned it from a group of people and then went on to just write about it, so they gave him credit for it. But anyways, basically back in 1939, he said that one night he encountered a group of women who claimed to be witches. They stripped him of his clothes and put him in the middle of a ceremonial circle. The circle was lined with naked women and they showed him their ways. From there, he learned briefly about Wicca and thought, Hey, this is great, let's preserve this and make sure that everyone knows about it. In 1954, he actually created a book titled Witchcraft Today that teaches others how to embrace Wicca fully. He then went on and became obsessed with the occult. In fact, it's believed that a number of Wiccans and Pagans were saved partly because of him. They could come out and be like, yeah, I'm a witch, without fear of being hanged or burned alive. To this day, he's one of the most relevant witches in history, but also one of the more controversial ones. In our third spot today, we have Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, otherwise known as Ursula Sontheil, was born in 1488 England. Legend has it that she was born during a massive thunderstorm and her mother gave birth to her in a cave. Her mother was only 15 at the time and was stuck raising Ursula in that cave by herself. That was until the monastery took her mother in and a local family took Ursula in. Eventually her mom was taken to a nunnery and they never saw each other again. Growing up, Ursula had a hard time fitting in. She had a large crooked nose, her back had a bend in it, and her legs were twisted. So right off the bat, people were like, yeah, she's a witch, just because of her appearance. In fact, people would bully her and call her hag face. Others believed her father was the devil. It didn't help that her mom refused to tell anyone who the father of her child was. So people were like, yeah, for sure. Her father's the devil. Not only that, she would spend a lot of time by the cave that she was born in. Now, how did she get the name Mother Shipton? Well, eventually she went on to marry a man named Tobias Shipton, and she took his last name. She eventually did partake in witchcraft and would make magical remedies for the sick. So people called her Mother Shipton because she was like a mother to all. At one point in her life, she became psychic and could see into the future. Soon after, she was called the Narenboro Witch. She made a living off of predicting and sharing the future with others. Moving on to number two, we have Isabel Godey. Isabel Godey was a Scottish woman from Aldern, a village near the Scottish Highlands. She is well known in history because in 1662, she confessed to witchcraft and may have been executed. We actually don't know because there's no official record of it, so it's a mystery. Basically, during that time, if you were thought to be a witch, they would torture you until you admitted to being one, even if you weren't actually one. Well, Isabel's case sparked a lot of interest because she admitted to being a witch willingly without torture or anything. And she went into great detail on everything that she was doing. She gave four separate confessions given over a six week period. For example, she said she made a pact with the devil and had been engaging in intercourse with him. She also said that she was part of a coven and would cast spells on the community. She claimed she put a curse on some male authority figures who she felt victimized by. She also cursed her landlord for being a pervert and put one on the local church minister. Lastly, she also admitted that she had the ability to turn into animals and that she was interacting with fairies. Over the centuries, a number of people have analyzed Isabel and have come up with some explanations for her actions. One is that she suffered from psychosis or hallucinations, whereas others think it was a ploy to get maybe a more lenient sentence. But of course, you still have the people who believe that she was an actual witch and did everything that she admitted to doing. And in our number one spot today, we have La Voisine. 
Catherine Montboisin or Lavoisin was a witch that lived in France in the mid 1600s. Her witchcraft mainly comprised of mixing and creating potions, poisons, and medicines. She also would tell people their fortunes and would hold black masses where people could come and make contact with the devil through her. It started off with her just providing palm readings and advice for people. But then she realized that her clients were mainly women who were coming to her with spousal problems. A number of them wanted their husband dead. So she started creating the potions to help them kill their husbands and gain fortune. Then things started to get darker and darker. She began practicing dark magic and witchcraft. This involved her leading a number of satanic rituals in the catacombs under her home. One time she even spilt the blood of an innocent victim as a sacrifice for the devil. Eventually Catherine was arrested for practicing witchcraft and for being involved in a number of murders. She was publicly burned at the stake in 1680. Kicking off at number 5, the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic. A text supposedly written sometime in the 15th century, the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic is a grimoire manuscript that describes the lost ancient rites of demonic knowledge. It is claimed that this text has been largely ignored by scholars throughout history due to its malevolent nature. The text, which is solely composed in Latin, is pretty much a handbook to demonology and much more worryingly appears to be a handy guide to necromancy. Although it was my favourite class in Diablo 2, Fishymancer, if you know, you know. The text was later picked up and an edited manuscript was published in 1998 by Richard Kikofer, an American medievalist and religious historian, where it was renamed Forbidden Rites and Necromancer's Manual of the 15th century. Stranger still though, a vast portion of this book has yet to be fully translated, so who knows what the hell is lurking deep within its message. Coming in at number 4. Picatrix, which is a word that I just love saying. Picatrix almost sounds cute, right? Well, unfortunately, it's pretty far from that. It has been summarized as the most thorough exposition of celestial magic in Arabic. In actual fact, though, Picatrix is a 400 page book of magic and astrology originally written in Arabic under the title Gayat al Hakim, allegedly dated all the way back to the 11th century, although some scholars have argued that it was in actual fact written in the first half of the 10th century. Gayat al Hakim loosely translates to the aim of the sage or the goal of the wise. It wasn't until 1256 when it was translated into Spanish by Alfonso X of Castile and later into Latin where it picked up the name Picatrix. The book synthesizes ancient works of magic with astrology and outlines a practice known as talismanic magic, a celestial power that allegedly draws on the cosmic will of the universe. It also draws on the neoplatic theory of hypostasis which essentially is the idea that there's always a bigger fish and it may or may not be a demon. Next up at number 3, The Grand Grimoire. A text so nefarious and mysterious that most people believe that it's kept deep in the bowels of the Vatican Church's ancient vaulted archives, which, sadly for us, isn't open to the public. While there is no evidence for this, the Grand Grimoire has nevertheless gained notoriety throughout the modern era, with its legend being popularised in the early 20th century. Plain and simple, this grimoire outlines black magic, with different editions dating the book between 1521, 1522, and 1421, respectively, although the most likely versions were written in the early 19th century. The Grand Grimoire is also known as Le Dragon Rouge or the Red Dragon and is later divided into two sections. The Sanctum Regnum which outlines the instructions for making a pact with a demon and commanding the spirit through the means of a blasting rod into doing the readers bidding, including instructions to make a pact with the devil. The second part is known as Le Secret Magique ou Le Grand Art de Poivre Parler ou More, which is the secret magic or the grand art of being able to speak with the dead, which I think is pretty self explanatory. <laughs> Swinging in at number two, the Swarm Book of Honorius, and this is perhaps one of the oldest existing medieval grimoires that can actually be verified in its entirety. It's important to note that this grimoire shouldn't be confused with the grimoire of Pope Honorius because this one is an entirely different story. Written by Honorius of Thebes, a mysterious historical figure shrouded in the occult, this grimoire is pretty much a play by play guide on how to conjure and command demons and allegedly contact a divine celestial power. It outlines the use of seals 
rules and operation outlined in the Key of Solomon which may or not be on this list. The first medieval reference of this text was in 1347. It appears numerous times throughout history in 1456 and frequently throughout the 14th and 15th century. Allegedly the swarm book of Honorius is a product of a conference of magicians who thought it would be a grand old idea to stick their heads together and condense all that vast mystical knowledge into one single volume. Well, that volume just so happened to be a staggering 93 chapters of demonic, all powerful, mystical know how. That's some pretty heavy reading. And finally, our number one spot the magical treatise of Solomon and the primary means that we even understand the term demon. The Magical Treatise of Solomon is some mystical, funky stuff shrouded in the mystery of an ancient world. Well, the Byzantine Empire to be specific. Also known by its more lofty name, the little key of the whole art of hygromancy found by several craftsmen and by the holy prophet Solomon. Which, you know, if you're going to name something, you may as well name it in full. This grimoire is literally the cornerstone of every grimoire ever made and serves as the bridge between the Roman era testament of Solomon and the Renaissance key of Solomon where the mystical era of demonology made its return. Allegedly it was based upon the found scripture of King Solomon laying out his knowledge to his son Rehoboam and it is pretty much a guidebook on a vast amount of magical techniques and tools to summon and control a host of demonic spirits, create charms, understand the differing means of divination and heal through the powerful use of herbalism. Whatever your thoughts, there's no doubt that the magical treatise of Solomon had a massive influence on everything from folklore and witchcraft to horror cinema and even Harry Potter and whatever it is, it makes for a bloody interesting story. 